Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Electric lighting was installed in the White House in 1891. Few people at the time had enough faith in the lighting to use it exclusively. After all, its use was barely a decade old. The electrical work at the White House was planned as a part of a well-funded project, and this project was to wire the State War and Navy Building, which was next door to the White House. The Edison Company installed a generator for both buildings that was put in the State War and Navy basement, and the wires were strung across the lawn and introduced in the White House from under the conservatory. President and Mrs. Harrison refused to operate the switches. They feared that they would be shocked, and they left the operation of these electric lights to the domestic staff. You and I think nothing of turning on a light switch, but back then in 1891, it was clearly terrifying to at least some people. And risk, that's what holds us back. If there's one thing that causes clients to hesitate a lot, it's usually risk. When this episode first ran, there were two parts, but in this rerun, we're just pulling out one of those two parts. If you'd like to listen to part two, which covers how pre-sale reduces risk, you can go back to our archives, which is at psychotactics.com slash 82, and you can find episode 82. But for now, this is our second out of six re-releases of the best episodes of the year 2016. And it's all about risk. Last month, I decided to buy some software for sound editing. And with that decision, I started a merry dance. You know that dance, don't you? It's called the should I, shouldn't I dance. First, I spent an enormous amount of time reading up on what I was about to buy. Did it fit my needs? Was it just a duplication of software that I already had? Would it be easy enough to learn? Then I delved deep into the testimonials. And 20 minutes later, I was still reading, not really sure what I was looking for. And yet, every testimonial clearly seemed to signal that the software was right for me. Almost an hour later, not sure of my decision, not entirely sure of my decision, I pressed the buy now button. So what was the price of the software? It was $350 and you think, ah, that makes sense. You have to do a fair amount of research before putting down that much money. And you'd be right. When faced with a slightly risky decision, we have to make sure we do our due diligence. Yet two days later, I did something completely inexplicable. I spent another hour going through the very same process. Different software, but I was looking at the features and the benefits and the testimonials and the comparison. And then I started to assess whether I needed the product. The only issue was that this new product, this new software, It was priced at $2.99. So why spend the same amount of time and effort on a product that costs less than a price of coffee? Welcome to the tangled universe of risk, where logic seems to go into this black hole, where we spend as much time debating whether to go ahead with the decision, even if the product or service is free.
We explore why risk isn't always connected to money or even the size of the transaction. And while it may seem that we behave unpredictably, our actions are remarkably consistent every time we have to make a decision. Worst of all, we know that it's pointless spending hours figuring out whether a $2.99 purchase is worth it. We still can't help ourselves. We still go through similar actions over and over again. So if we're so helpless when we're aware of our own actions, how can we predict the behavior of our clients? And how do we reduce risk or even eliminate it? How do we get to the stage where the client doesn't even have to read your sales page and buys your product completely on trust, even when it's an expensive purchase? Let's dig into this crazy universe of risk. Let's see what it has for us. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover three topics as always. The first is why clients buy. So we're going to figure out what are the elements of risk. Then we'll look at why the risk factor changes with every version of your product or service. And then how pre-sell dramatically ramps down risk. These sections are pretty large, so we're going to tackle them one podcast at a time. And the first one is why clients don't buy. We look at what goes into risk and what are the elements of risk. And for this, we have to start with the brain audit. Now, if you've already read the brain audit, you're probably going to think, well, I've read it, I understand it, I've read it probably a couple of times or thrice even, and this seems like you've already covered this before. The interesting part about it is as I started writing about this piece, about this risk factor, I discovered some things that I haven't figured out in, well, over 12 years. So I would encourage you to stay with the podcast and listen in because I think you will find that to be true as well. If you haven't read The Brain Audit well, listen to this, then go and get your copy and read it twice, thrice, because every time you read it, it reveals a little more of itself to you. But let's get to the main part, which is why clients don't buy and understanding of risk. If you go to a playground today, you'll find that modern seesaws are kind of boring. You don't need to have someone to sit on the other side. They have all these fancy spring mechanisms so that, in effect, you could seesaw your way to your heart's content. And you could do this all by yourself. So what the modern seesaw misses is the fun that came with understanding balance. Now, as kids, the seesaw mechanism was quick to demonstrate how balance makes an enormous difference. And when we decide to look at risk, we must first understand balance. If you've read the Brain Audit, you know that there are seven elements. So the first three of those seven elements are the problem, the solution, and the target profile. The next four are objections, testimonial, risk reversal and uniqueness. So the first three elements are all about attraction, how to get the customer in, how to get their attention. And the next four are about risk. Risk, as you can see, is the big boy on the seesaw. No matter how good you are at attracting a prospect, there's an enormous risk factor always lurking on the sales playground. To understand how we need to reduce that risk, let's examine every one of these four elements one at a time. On our list we have, as we said, objections, testimonial, risk reversal, and uniqueness. And of course, that list makes no sense at all because what we just saw was testimonials, objections, risk reversal, and uniqueness. If this topic is about risk, then isn't risk reversal supposed to take care of risk? Interestingly, no. Risk reversal is only part of the whole gang of four. Let's start off with the first big guy, which is objections. 
Objections are the harbinger of risk. They are like vultures waiting to land and jump off the sail. But just like vultures, the reputation of objections is misplaced. Every possible purchase has not one, but many objections. But even if we were to sidestep the sales process, just look at your life, you'd see that objections play a very big role. Let's say someone said to you, hey, come over on Sunday. Now notice, it's a very simple invitation to someone's place. And notice how your brain goes for a little spin. That's because your brain is bringing up objections, even if you're keen to go over to your friend's place. Is it just a come over situation, you wonder? Or will there be lunch? Will you have to have lunch in advance? Do you have to take anything? All of these questions, they start circling madly in your brain. So then you think, should I make an excuse? Should I stay home? And the moment you do all of these things, you've entered the world of objections. Now, there are two big reasons why these objections show up. And the first and the most important is that objections are aroused because the information, that necessary information, it's missing. And we notice in the come over to my place situation, there is a complete lack of information. And this drives the prospect crazy. Most objections, they rise from the fact that you've held back a lot of the information and probably a lot of the important information. That information is needed to make the sale. So whether you're buying a car or software for $2.99, the objections are what will hold the client back repeatedly. And we may say, well, I know this stuff. Objections are marketing 101. And yet, time and time again, a client will come right to the point of buying the product or service, and then they back away. In some cases, this is because the information is not available. But in today's world, there's also a pretty good chance that the client hasn't seen the information. Because we're all drowning in information, we start to skim. And when we skim, we miss out certain points. Points that are important to us. So this builds up the risk tremendously. And when you look at an expensive product, an expensive service, the risk goes up many times over. At this point in time, the article writing course, that is the Psychotactics article writing course, is about $3,000. Now, $3,000 is a fair bit of money, even when you're absolutely sure of the results. Immediately, there are a ton of objections that come up. So they are like this. Will Sean be present at all times? Will there be specific assignments and will they be looked at daily? Will the group I'm in work out? After all, I don't know any of them. Will there be specific guidelines for the course? So a whole bunch of questions come up on a consistent basis. And of course, the answer to all of this is yes, I will be present at all times. There will be specific assignments and so on. But the sales page must in graphics and text, take apart the objections. Or if you have a prospectus, it should take apart that, ex that objection. Or right now, like I'm doing in the podcast, it should take apart the objection. And this brings us to a very important juncture. No matter what you say on your sales page, it's just you saying stuff to sell your course. What an audience looks at right after you've reduced their risk is the very next element. And that is testimonials. So we've moved on from objections and we're going to testimonials. Let's look at testimonials and find out why they're so crucial when you're selling something. Testimonials are the opposite of objections. Yes, you heard right. 
Testimonials are the flip side of objections. They are not this wonderful thing that your clients write about your business. Instead, they have a very clear and definite purpose. The purpose is to destroy the objections, to destroy the risk, but from a third party point of view. Which is why you need to first list all the objections that you get and then if you get more of them, list all of them. And once you get these objections, get to your current clients and then get them to address the risk with their testimonials. So when you look at the article writing course, for instance, we realize that there are courses that are $1,000 or $500 or even $150. Now, they may not be the competition for psychotactics, but you have to know that firsthand from a client who's done the course, someone who's already taken the journey. They need to tell you how the course has tiny increments, how it has groups that magically work together, that I, Sean, am there all the time that I'm always hovering, always moving your head in little bits. But they also need to compare it with courses that they've done before, experiences that they've been through, experiences that they've found to be less than satisfactory. And to make sure this happens, we ask the alumni of every course as many as 17 questions. In return, we get a 1,500-word answer. Notice what's happening to you as you skim through that answer in the prospectus. You suddenly notice that there are over 80 pages of testimonials. Maybe you read one or two or maybe you get to three. But very quickly, those walls of risk are coming down. But why? It's because the testimonial attacked the risk from three angles. First, it took the objection head on. Second, it was a third party experience. But most importantly, it wasn't just a few lines. 1500 words mean a lot to a prospect. They paint a picture that 20 or 30 words could never do. And the risk factor starts to reduce considerably. But we're not done yet because We've only dealt with two elements of risk, and that is objections and testimonials. And it's now time for that fancy phrase, the risk reversal. It seems odd, doesn't it? Why have a risk reversal when you already dealt with the objections, when you already have the testimonials that deal with the objections on a flip side? And this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. And this is the question that we had to ask ourselves when we ran into the concept of risk reversal. Back in the early days of psychotactics, we would sell home study versions of our courses and workshops. Back then, in the good old days, clients were more than happy to get a big box in the mail. And that box would contain a binder with lots of notes and yes, CDs. Now, as we continued to sell the product, we'd get a few returns now and then, and every product gets returns. The funny thing is, when we'd open the return products, we were always amused at how immaculate the contents of the boxes happened to be. The CDs looked like they'd never been touched or rather touched in, then wiped clean. The notes, they didn't have a smear, they were not torn anywhere, they were not... nothing. It was absolutely nothing. It was absolutely spotless. The boxes looked almost identical to the condition that they were shipped out. And this made us realize that risk reversal is not the same as objections. Risk reversal is the biggest fear that the client has. A fear that must be addressed. It must be put in bold, bright lights so that it cannot be missed. The risk wasn't that the clients wanted their money back. 
They already had their money before they gave it to me. They didn't want their money back. The risk was that they were afraid to go through the package in detail because they figured that if they spoiled or soiled the materials in any way, they wouldn't get their money back. From that came this whole factor of the lawn mower guarantee. This is a guarantee that we put in place. Now the guarantee was simple. It said, if you don't like the product, you're free to take your lawn mower and run over the CDs and run over the notes and then put them in the box and ship it back. And you can see what happened, right? The moment the clients realized that they didn't have to hold this book and these CDs with kid gloves, the sales went up exponentially. They realized that this is what was stopping them. It wasn't the money back guarantee. It was the fear of, in case something went wrong, they wouldn't get their money back. When Zappos.com started selling shoes online, there were smirks. Who would buy shoes online? Sure, shoes were a $40 billion market, but shoes online? Even eventual CEO of Zappos.com, Tony Shea, he wasn't very sure about this. But his eventual partner, Nick Swinman, was prepared. It's a $40 billion market, he emphasized. And the most interesting thing was that 5% of shoe sales were already being sold by mail order catalog. But what was their risk reversal? What was Zappos' risk reversal? A money-back guarantee, right? After all, shoes may not fit. They may not look as good as they do online. Or you may just change your mind. But no, that wasn't the guarantee. The risk was that you'd have to figure out how to ship the shoes back if you didn't like it. So Zappos put in a 365-day return policy with free shipping both ways. Free shipping both ways. That's the biggest risk of all. That's the risk that the clients felt. That's the frustration that the clients felt. That needed to be put in bold. That's what they did. And this is the part that most of us may not take the time to figure out. What is the client's most significant risk? It doesn't have to be the biggest risk. It can be just this irritation factor of having to put it back in a box, go to the post office, and mail it back to Zappos. So what is that most significant risk? In some cases, it's a simple money-back guarantee. But in most cases, the clients will tell you what is their biggest risk, what is their biggest frustration. To find that real risk, you have to dig. To find that biggest risk or that most irritating risk, you have to get to clients and list all the possible risks and objections and get them to pick their biggest risk. Or to get them to say, hey, this is what I think is bigger than whatever you have got on that list. And sometimes even that may not be enough. The packages that came back to us untouched told us a very precise story that no one had voiced before. And to get to the real risk reversal, to reduce that risk, you can't hope that just a shiny money-back guarantee will work. You have to dig and dig deep, and you will get to the answer. But nothing needs more digging than the last element, which is uniqueness. So we've covered objections and testimonials and risk reversal, but all that does is set up a client to go to the competition. So why does it set up the client to go to competition? Once you've covered all the elements, like objections and testimonies, risk reversal, the client needs to know why they should buy from you and not from anybody else, because they've got all their questions answered. The risk has been taken out. Most of the risk has been taken out. And now they're going, why you? Why should I buy from you? So if we were to drag the article writing course back into the picture, we'd notice that the competition may be offering courses at a lower rate. They may be promising quicker results. After all, this article writing course takes 12 weeks. That's three whole months. So you have assignments and you have to do them daily and they are checked daily. 
And this means that you have to run your business and you have to do assignments every single day. This makes the course baby tough. So what is baby tough? If you have a cat, you have to put out their food, their water, and that's probably all you need to do in terms of work. A dog, now, that would involve a walk, some playtime, and a lot more work. A baby, on the other hand, a newborn, that means that you're sleep deprived for quite a while. <laughs> and that's what Baby Tough is all about. That's the uniqueness of the article writing course. It's Baby Tough. It means that you have to work extremely hard for three months. You have to have all these sleepless nights. And the hard work is what shows up as a skill when you finish it, when you're done with it on the other side. Right before we had this uniqueness in place, it was a lot harder to sell the course. We tackled the objections, we had testimonials, we had the risk reversal, but it was very hard to sell the course quickly enough. So we spent all these weeks trying to promote it and then it takes up a lot of your energy and your time. The moment we added the uniqueness, the seats were filled in a day, then half a day, in some cases as little as 25 minutes. A client wants to get the most unique product or service possible. To get anything but the best is hardly acceptable. And the moment the article writing course became baby tough, or as we started to talk about it as baby tough, the clients got the message. They knew that they were in for some real work. They knew that they were going to get real results. And the other courses with their easy and quick results were now a liability. And this is the cool part about uniqueness. It can stand alone. You can get rid of the objections, you can get rid of the testimonials, you can get rid of the risk factors and just have uniqueness and clients can still buy from you. When you think of the Domino's Pizza slogan, which is 30 minutes or it's free, what you see there is a combination of uniqueness and risk reversal. 30 minutes, that's the uniqueness. We will get to you in 30 minutes or it's free and that's a risk reversal. But the uniqueness itself could stand out, which is in 30 minutes, it'll get to you. And this is what clients are looking for. They're looking for that one thing that enables them to decide why they should choose you. Because uniqueness creates extreme clarity. We're all faced with decisions all the time. It's, why do I choose this computer? Why do I choose this chartered accountant over the next one? What you don't need at that point is muddiness. The more fuzzy the message, the less likely your audience is to pick up you over any other company. So working on your uniqueness is your top priority. And every product or every service should have their own uniqueness. The company may have one level of uniqueness, but every product and service, you need to know why would a client pick this? What is it that makes this product so different? Or how do you present it so that it's different? So if we took two of the article writing courses and say we pitched them against each other, we would still have to know why would you choose this article writing course versus that one. So we have to do this. We have to do this with the live article writing course versus say if we were going to have an article writing course workshop versus an article writing course webinar series. It seems like it's the same thing, but it's different. And it's not like we're having all that stuff. We're just having the article writing course. But if we were to do that, you would still need to know what makes this unique. What makes the live course unique? What makes the webinar series unique? Knowing that is what eliminates, reduces that risk. So uniqueness needs to separate you from the competition. It needs to remove that muddiness factor. And this brings us to the end of this episode. So what did we cover in this episode?
When we think of risk, it is very easy to isolate ourselves to just the risk reversal. There is no doubt that the risk reversal is very important. And once you find the real risk involved, like Zappos did, that both ways free shipping, that was more important than anything else. You too have to dig into the nuances of your product or service. The objections also form a very critical part. They can't be left out because they cause too much chaos in the mind of the client. Even a simple Sunday outing without the proper information, it becomes a matter of should I, shouldn't I? And testimonials, they're a science. They're beautiful. It's worth delving into. Getting long, detailed answers, they turn your testimonials into an experience. Not some sugary, nice things that your client is saying about your product or service. So all of these elements, the objections, the testimonial, the risk reversal, they play a very important role. But what's the one thing that you need to work out as quickly as possible? It's always the uniqueness. What is it that makes your product or service unique? What makes it different from the competition? And this is the question that clients want you to answer right away. Because it creates clarity. And the client can then justify the purchase to themselves and to others in their world. They can tell them why they brought the product or service. It removes that muddiness. It dramatically increases that clarity. So uniqueness is the one thing that you really want to work on if you want to reduce risk. And then test it out. You know, is it like the two-way shipping thing? Is it powerful enough or is it just something in your head? Test it out. In the brain audit, there are two distinct parts, the attraction factor and the risk. It's like a seesaw, an old-fashioned seesaw. It's fun when both the sides are balanced. Risk? Risk is pretty much the fat boy. So pay attention to risk because it makes a huge difference in your sales. So what's happening in Psychotactics land? Well, not a lot. In the first re-release episode, I told you what I would do every morning during the summer break, which, if you don't already know, is in December in the Southern Hemisphere. And usually, when I talk about this break, and I talk to other people, you know, people that are my friends online or people I meet online, and they automatically assume that I'm on the break, but also working a bit, or I'm checking email. They are so taken aback when I tell them I do no such thing. I don't check email. I don't use the computer. Well, I will use a computer if I'm editing some photos or doing something that's not work-related. And in the past, I've tried to get into 5000 BC, which is our membership site, but I'm often shooed away by the members. They tell me, go on vacation. They say, this is about what we're trying to do. No, don't spoil it. Go away. So we have elves that take care of 5000 BC while I'm away. And it ticks along nicely for those four weeks. However, this astounds most of the online marketers that I know. To them, it seems perfectly plausible to be on a surfboard in the morning and then surfing their websites in the afternoon. But I see a vacation differently. I see it as a time to gain vacation momentum. Through the year, it's all work momentum, and it's not always easy to get to vacation momentum. So going cold turkey off work is the best way I know to just stop it, to just go into that vacation mode. Netflix and books are a constant companion. In the mornings, I'm in the purple room, I'm having my chai, but as the day ticks along, I'll retreat to what we call the summer room. 
I'll lie on the bed, I'll watch movies, I'll possibly drink a beer, or I'll get a bunch of novels from the library and I'll use that to detox my system from work. And then Christmas will roll along, Christmas Day will roll along, it's time for food, family, and even more beer. And that's pretty much it. It doesn't sound like much, but to me, it's time well wasted. So from time well wasted land, here's Sean D'Souza, that's me, and I'm saying bye for now. Have a good holiday time, whatever you call it, we call it Christmas down here in the Southern Hemisphere. So have a great Christmas, have a great holiday. I'll see you in the next year. Bye-bye.